You're listening to the Ben Rod Podcast. In this episode, I speak with Fernando Ferreira. Fernando is a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. He also owns Gracie Baja Monterey in Mexico, and he's a senior tech executive currently working in the computer vision space. We dig deep into a previous role that he had where they did eye scanning for lie detection, and we discuss the moral implications of that technology. We also dig deep into his current role around machine learning and how that works and and the future of machine learning. We also talk about jujitsu, obviously, him being a black belt and it being one of my biggest passions. We talk a little bit about how to continue rolling as you age, um, how to take care of your partners, what are some self-defense techniques that people should pick up along the way. And he shares a little bit about his journey, um, being uh, being somebody who adopted Brazilian jujitsu uh, later in life, right? He wasn't a, a 16 year old um, first learning. So he, he learned in a different path and it's, it's really interesting. And I think you'll find it interesting too. As always, this podcast is sponsored by Powertrain Tape. It's the best finger tape in the world, in my opinion. And why do I have that opinion? Because it's my company. So uh, I'm pretty fond of it and the people that buy it tend to like it. So keep liking it and make sure to like the podcast. Uh, subscribe, click the bell so that you're notified when the next one comes out. Thanks for listening. Three, two, one. Fernando. Good morning, brother. Good, Good morning. To Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, it's man. Great being here. I'm stoked Thank you for having, having me. me. My pleasure. Um, you guys flew in. Sorry, you drove in. Uh, you're living in the Houston area right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we moved to Houston about two years ago. So from, exactly two years ago in yeah. July. From? From Monterrey, Mexico. Awesome. So uh, yeah, Houston. Two years. It's been it's been great. I've been uh, I've been an immigrant my whole life. Yeah. Since I was born. So one more. Yeah. <laughs> it's like my well, now, seventh what? city. So it's, where, it's good. so so I wasn't gonna ask this question, but now I'm I'm curious. Where, where were you born? So I was born in Uruguay. Oh. Um, and uh, when I was about eleven months old, my parents moved out. Um. Uh, and uh, we moved to Chile, and then from there we moved to uh, Canada, back to Chile, from Chile to Brazil, from Brazil to Costa Rica, from Costa Rica to Brazil, back to Costa Rica, then I moved to Monterrey, Mexico, we then moved to Utah, Salt Lake City, back to Monterrey, Mexico, with six months in Mexico City in between, yeah. and then Houston, Wow. two years ago. So Wow. I've been an immigrant my whole life. Wow. So it's yeah, it's it's good. That explains a lot though. You're so friendly. You're you're good at <laughs> you're good at connecting with people. Like it's a yeah. survive like if you're going to move around like that you have to, to survive. Yeah, you really do. It's good for sales too. Yeah. I mean, when you've been doing sales for so long, uh you get some good skills. Yeah. Some good people skills, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. I should do just I should do an intro um because um uh, we haven't done that yet. We just dive yeah. right in. So we've been sitting here having coffee. Uh, <laughs> so um, pronounce your last name for me, though. I don't want to. So so in Spanish, it's Ferreira. Okay. It's a Portuguese last name. So if, if you go to Brazil, they'll, they'll say Ferreira. Okay. But uh, yeah, it, it's a tough one. Living in the U.S. with that last name is, a t- is tough. Yeah. Well, I wasn't sure if I should. There's an I. It sneaks in there. So Ferreira in Portuguese, or, Ferreira in Spanish. Ferreira. Uh, yeah, most people just call me Fernando because of that. <laughs> I've got a lot of people. Hey, Fernando Ferreira. That's that's yeah. usually in English. I, and I didn't want to do that. So Ferreira. I say yeah. Ferreira. Yeah. Okay. Me too. My last name is Portuguese as well. Rodrig. A lot of people add the Z on the end for me. Mm-hmm. That's why I usually just go by. Bedroom. Rod. Yeah. yeah, it's just so much more simple. Makes and sense. it's cleaner too. It's three, yeah, three it's letters. Three letters. Um, so Fernando, you're a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Yes. Under uh, Gracie Baja. Yes. Um, do you still own? Do you still own the school? Partial owner of the school. I'm partial owner. Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Which I want to talk about that. How you manage? How you manage that? Yeah. Um, and you um, you work full time. For mm-hmm. a tech company that does computer vision, yes, um, I really want to get into your thoughts on. Um, uh, we touched on this briefly, but you know, eye scanning pertaining to lie detection and things like that. Yeah, definitely. I'd like to understand some of the bleeding edge. Um, <laughs> all of Fernando's statements do not represent that of his employer. Blah blah blah. Exactly. Legally, yeah. Yeah. But I'm I'm very curious definitely. about kind of bleeding edge of you know what you guys are looking at in terms of. 
I know you're revolutionizing the whole the, the warehousing industry. And, Retail, especially. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of that is um, is uh, doing inference on um, wearable devices to to basically scan warehouses and environments and um, medicines, scanning patients. Like, there's a lot of really cool applications of your technology. So, um, I'm I'm really curious about that. So, full time doing that, as well as managing as managing to um, stay happily married and raise wonderful girls, two wonderful <laughs> girls, right? Yeah, right. So, um, there's a lot of balance that has to happen there. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah, man. Uh, I, I've I've been selling tech for about 20 years, uh, 22 years, um, from software to simulators, mining simulators, right? Uh, I was with a company that does uh, lie detection uh, by looking at your eyes for about five years. And now I'm with a company that does what you mentioned, computer vision. So we do augmented reality, things like that. Now, it's it's obviously uh, early stage right now so what we do right now is is we look at a barcode on any product and uh, provide uh, AR so augmented reality mm -hmm. uh, AR layers where you can provide information to the customer or the employee on that on that product through right. like color recognition something like that yeah eventually it'll get to the point where where the model will recognize an object based on the shape the color the label so, so there's something going on there, but uh, it'll take a little bit longer, uh, especially because it's a very complex AI model, mm -hmm. and you're running the software on on a cell phone. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot to get it to run there, right? But but right says, now it, that it says works. A, that says a lot about edge computing and one of the challenges with it, right? In getting embedded software and, and doing remote inference. So it's, it's it, for example, like looking at cancer cells or something like that, like you have to have a really smart yeah. telescope in order to do that or, or plug it into some sort of, you know, laptop, but, but getting it onto the smartphone, getting it into glasses, that's, it's that's next gen. Or a robot, right? Which yeah. is the same. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, I, I guess, you know, uh, even, even the uh, light detection stuff and, and the uh, computer vision stuff, all that you're looking at is is AI models that can do very simple tasks, right? Um, I'm saying very simple compared to AI movies. Oh yeah, yeah the yeah. models are People's, not simple. Expectation. Yeah. <laughs> For us right now, the models are not simple. But but if you think about the task, these are very simple tasks, right? So you have you have an AI model looking at the size of your pupil, and uh, just basically mapping out which movements represent deception or truth. Um, you have is that prone to human error? Like how how do you how do you validate that? So so I mean I know that there's some uh, neuro linguistic programming, right? We 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 look here when we're accessing memory. I'm I'm going to get it wrong. Yeah. I don't remember, but there's quadrants, right? Yeah. So how do you? Yeah. So obviously there's going to be some creativity accessed in lying. Right, some nervousness, um, maybe twitching, dilation. How, how do you? So, 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 uh, for all our jujitsu guys, let's let's do a jujitsu analogy, right? So, so you <laughs> let's say let's that. say we we sit here and we say, Ben, we're gonna build a model that um, takes a camera, looks at a jujitsu match, mm -hmm. and uh, tells us if these are white, blue, purple, brown, or black belts, without looking at the belt. Just okay. looking at, at the match itself, right? Okay. So uh, we sit down and we build our basic model. So Ben, what does a white belt do? Oh, um, a scissor of, sweep. A lot of this. <laughs> Some of that. Okay, okay, that's good. Let's write it down. <laughs> we, we got that one. There's a lot of heavy, scissor heavy sweeps. Panting. Um, uh, cross choke. I'm, I'm speaking stuff. about me as a white belt. That's, that's not meant for any white belts in particular. <laughs> <laughs> the memory's still fresh. <laughs> so, so we built that very basic model where we say, we tell the computer, you're going to see uh, scissor sweeps, you're going to see cross strokes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I say, you know what? There's some really good black belts that are really good at scissor sweeps. Okay. So what's the difference? Okay. The way they execute. So we start feeding the model. It comes to a point where that model identifies poorly the belts. So let's say it has 40% accuracy, right? Okay, this is white, this is purple, this is black. 
40% accuracy. Why? Because we fed the model and humans are really bad at looking at big chunks of information. We're bad at it. Yeah. Okay. So we just found two or three patterns. Now, if you now, instead of uh, teaching the model what we think should happen, you feed that model with millions of matches, what it's going to do is it's going to start finding patterns mm -hmm. that machines are really good at finding. So now it's going to start finding things like black belt grips in a cross choke look like this, and usually the legs are in this position. Mm -hmm. Also, they usually cross right foot over left versus left over right. Things that you and I would never see, the model starts seeing, right? So, so, so the model begins at, let's say, 40% accuracy, and then this machine learning model brings it up to 80, mm -hmm. 90, 95. So that's what we call machine learning. And, and, and for lie detection, it's exactly the same. We know that uh, uh, there's a bunch of studies, this is public information, uh, we know that pupils dilate when you lie in most people, maybe 80% of people. Mm -hmm. But then you feed the model with 200 different eye movements that you're tracking, right? And what happens is it, it starts finding patterns that you didn't know about, that you didn't study. So now, now things, it's basically the other side of it. The first side is, okay, I know this. This is the way the model should work. Now the AI or the machine learning model finds other stuff that looks like it indicates deception. So now you have to study that and publish a study around those new findings. But mm -hmm. you didn't find them. It was a machine. Yeah. So that's, that's basically how AI works today. Yeah. There's, there's, it, it's quite basic if you really think about it. So that's why we're so far from having a general AI. Yeah. Like people freak out this machine is going to be better than us at something or we're going to lose jobs or we're so far from that man it's probably centuries before we get to a point where the machine can think yeah all they can do right now is process information right so so um when you get to the computer vision piece um right now it's it's very basic it's not even at that stage uh but as mobile devices have better processors and more memory and uh, better cameras, it'll get to a point where you can build a model that not only detects the objects that you taught it, it can start learning by itself. Like, okay, what's that? Oh, um, it looks like a coffee cup, but I don't know. Okay, show it to the user, see what they say. This is wrong. Okay, it's not it. And it'll learn by itself. So when you get to maybe 40,000, 50,000 objects, mm -hmm. In three years, you can get to 50 million objects in hours. Right, the, so it's exponential. The, yeah, yeah. And the, the that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think one of the challenges associated with that is just the computational power to build. It's called it's called a neural network, right? It just it's a it's a it's a series of nodes that does mathematical calculations to understand what that image actually represents through like lighting differences, right, contours. And, and then it basically puts a weight on, hey, this has cup-like properties. Like we, we think with 99% accuracy, it's, it's a cup. But um, some of the challenges is that they've had with machine learning is that, um, for example, like you might have cats and dogs and you might want the machine to say, um, to tell you which one's the cat. So you feed it a thousand cat pictures and a thousand dog pictures. Um, and it starts recognizing that, hey, there's usually carpet in the background and a cat picture. There's usually grass in the background and a dog picture. Therefore, a cat sitting exactly. in the grass is a dog. And so that's, that's about how smart you know, it is at this point where it's like there's a lot of errors built into it because things that we, we're processing a lot more than right now what these machines are capable. But I love what you said about it's the, the data. One thing that we're bad at, so we use our, um, so I think there's a lot going on beneath the consciousness, but what we're conscious of, we can only focus on one thing at a time. 
Um, you can begin to train yourself in, in jiu-jitsu. You can get really good at jiu-jitsu, but you're really only thinking about a couple of moves at a time. A lot is coming from beneath the surface, right? It's all that wiring that you spent years, years honing, yeah. whether you realize it or not. Some, you know, and, um, yeah. and right now, you know, we have machines that are beating world champions at Go. You know, first there was chess, now there's a Go, a much more complex game. And they taught themselves, we don't know how they learned, which is crazy. But we know that they used large chunks of data that they had access to. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is like when you start getting into, for example, like like warehousing, um, humans are creative. We 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 see patterns, right? We're we're um, easily distracted, unfortunately. But these machines, they're not distracted, and they can hold you know mm -hmm. billions of lines yeah. in a database and have access to it in a split second, and then. At that point, I feel like in some ways, while it's an extension of us, just like the internet is, it has all the data, but it kind of still has to dumb it down to us because our senses are still so limited. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I'm sure you guys are struggling right now. For example, um, who are you using for like, I know you may, you have an SDK, a software development kit. Who, who are you working with right now, for example, like glasses and wearables? Um, we don't work with anyone specifically. It's the SDK is, is very agnostic. Reader. Yeah. So it runs on uh, iOS, Android, uh, Windows, and Linux, right? So if you have any device that has one has one of those, yeah, uh, you're good. You can run it. Uh, but but uh, it's it's machines are really good at very specific tasks, mm -hmm. and as you said, we are not really good at focusing on just one thing. Machines are not really good at not focusing. So it's very limiting, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, it's very difficult to build a model to get to general AI because they're only aware of what's in the model, right? Yeah. So so maybe you're, you're learning Go, right? And uh, something comes up on TV and you learn something new and you got distracted. Mm -hmm. The machine cannot do that. Yeah. Right. So, so there is there is in in terms of of building models, the biggest challenge I think is they're so specific. They're going to be very good at very simple specific tasks. Mm -hmm. Simple for them, not for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Calling a computer them is a mistake. What? <laughs> but, but you know, let's let's talk. Let's, well, they're let's, they're let's listening. So. Um... <laughs> They're watching. Yeah. How do we know there isn't already an AGI, right? We never know. But, yeah. but anyway, so, so in, in terms of <laughs> devices, uh, to answer your question, the SDK that, that uh, Scandit built is, is agnostic. Okay. Uh, and it has to be because some very interesting applications are not for the warehouse. They're not for the employee. They're for the consumer. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a peanut allergy. You can have an AR layer on your phone. That's awesome. That shows That's you. That's life-saving. There you go. Yeah. You, can, you can scan all the products and it'll show you in red the ones that you shouldn't yeah. even touch. It, yeah. So so when you get to that point, you need something that is agnostic. Or pharmacists, right? I mean, I, I saw that. I did I did cheat. I watched some of the videos, which, by the way, whoever does your guys' promotional videos. Our marketing just, VP is amazing. Just a really good job. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't a <laughs> necessarily a plug, but I was just like, wow, you took like warehousing technology, you know, kind of where it is. And it could be really boring. And showed um, the future, like the application, and the application isn't boring. Yeah. Like when I look inside of like an Amazon warehouse, like I'm just, I mean, it's you know drool. Yeah. I'm still wondering like why the humans are in there because, you know, they do some very basic, but it's the it's the, still the creative task. It's still like the gut level tasks um, that, that humans are performing. It's a distraction, but the it's, picking and stuff, like it's that's all that's all the robots and that's all scanning and they're running their routes and they're aware of each other. The lack of distraction, that's huge in autonomous cars. The driving, that's the biggest part. I would say that you know, you're know you truly paying attention while you're driving, being generous 70% of the time. I mean, honestly, you know, if, we, if you said, well, how much time are you in deep thought in the back of your mind yeah. and in cruise control or you know, messing with the radio or talking to your passenger or looking at the Google map, like 70% would be really generous. And that's only when you're braking maybe taking off, turning, yeah. the rest of the time is just autopilot, literally. Agreed. I think self-driving is easy 
if all the cars are self-driving. Yeah, they have to communicate. That's it. Yeah. When you have humans, that's why it doesn't work. It's coming though. It's going to be. It's like. Is it an option not to have a safety belt now, yeah. or or can you still buy a car that doesn't have um, a uh, an airbag, yeah. you know, or a crumple zone, or it's like if you basically in order to 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 meet um, uh, standards in order to be sold, you know, as as a safe automobile, there's going to have to be some kind of communication layer, and there's going to have to be. Uh, an open standard over time, and I'm speaking outside of my experience. There might already be an open standard in the autonomous car industry, but if there isn't, then uh, there's your sign. Yeah. Um, you know, create one so that all the cars can communicate. Because it shouldn't be Ford's only talking to Ford's, right? Tesla's only yeah. talking to Tesla's. I'm sure Elon Musk is already. Yeah, there's there's a couple of, of roads there that they're following, but um, but um, as you know, <laughs> if, if we had with the models we can build today, if 100% of the cars were self-driving, it would work everywhere. Yeah. Especially if you have good GPS maps, like you yeah. have in the US, right? Um, the issue is, is the percentage. So, so as the uh, percentage of self-driving cars increases, the safety will grow exponentially, just like any model. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. It doesn't change. Yeah, you know, as 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 the model grows, the benefit is exponential. Yeah, the issues are also exponential, but that's another conversation, right? But um, I think it's moving in the right direction. It's uh, it's stuff that we know how to do. Mm -hmm. We've known how to do it for a long time. We were talking about these models when I went to college twenty five years ago. But we didn't have the power to do it. Now we do, yeah. and it's on a phone. Yeah, you know, and a lot of that is just it's. Um, thank goodness for for so, so, Google says don't be evil. They're they might not be following that all the way. By the way, <laughs> on on Monday I'm talking to a guy from Google. That should be fun. Um, <laughs> but uh, if they say don't be evil, and they've done a lot. You know, they're they're doing I think um, a lot that's maybe doesn't fall within that. But that's a pretty broad spectrum of defining yeah. evil but some things that they've done have been pretty awesome like open sourcing tensorflow and, and open sourcing a lot of software and really driving that change and tensorflow is one of the technologies that's behind building these machine learning models and and basically oh, by open sourcing it they democratized machine learning artificial intelligence deep learning and all of these things so you know kudos kudos to them for that and i think that that's one of the between that and cloud computing, the ability to access an entire data center yeah. in a split second and only pay for it, you know, for like by minute, by second, yeah. um, is is huge. Now, yeah. the barrier of entry for any machine learning startup is significantly lowered. It's not the IBMs of the world that are going to be, you know, providing this cutting edge tech. Yeah, yeah. I think the other big player there is Amazon. Yeah. So. Well, that's what so that's what I used to do. Is I, I so I would um, cloud computing yeah. and specifically helping people onboard onto uh, Amazon and helping mm. a very very large social network onboard their okay. AI that makes components sense. Yep. onto Amazon. So that's kind of how I got into the whole thing. Where I'm the just whole like, tech thing. <laughs> well, the whole the whole the whole artificial intelligence deep learning thing. Where I was just like, this is this is the future. It's like the beginning of a space race, and you're wa like in our generation, like we get to sit here and watch it, and it's it's pretty incredible. The way our kids are going to interact with things like Alexa, yeah, you know, in the future is going to be night and day from the. Uh oh, I think I might have woken her up. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the downside, right? Yeah, she's always listening. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So mm. I, I would, I, you know, it's fun. I would love to. Um, th so there's there's two things I want to cover for sure. I know that that we're we're tied on time. Um, we're both going to uh, the fourth anniversary of Gracie Baja yeah. San Antonio. It's great. Good job, Fabi. Four years, um, man. The uh, there's two things that I want to I want to talk about. Y yeah. You had you had mentioned in your text the moral implications of um, doing lie detection yeah, and, and things one. like that. Um, and, and now that you're, you're, you're no longer, you know, working there, you, you, I mean, I'm not talking about the organization, but in, in like in that exact field, um, yeah. what are you, what are, what are some of the things that you saw and maybe some apprehensions that you, in terms of usage? Well, number one, it's not perfect, right? 
Yeah. If you got 90% accuracy. It's, could be better than our judicial system. Yeah, but it's still, you know, if you have... It could be used as evidence in court? Um, kind of. Okay. So in some cases, judges will allow it, like the polygraph. Yeah. In some cases, they won't. But it's not conclusive because it's not perfect, right? So yeah. Let's go to something easier, simple. Uh, let's say you have a thousand people applying for a job. I like how you break down analogies. Yeah. I, I think in analogies too. Yeah, it, it, it helps, right? Yeah. So let's go to something very simple. You have a thousand people applying for a job. Yeah. You're going to let 50, let's say you have 90% accuracy. You're going to let 50 liars get through and you're going to throw out 50 good guys. So, so there is the first implication. Uh, second one, let's say it falls into the wrong hands. It's in really good hands right now, but let's say it falls uh, into wrong hands. Let's say you end up having, right now it's a cloud service. Let's say you end up having a, a standalone device and it falls into the wrong hands and they say that you steal our drugs and you say, no, the machine gets it wrong. That's mm -hmm. an issue. Right. So, so the issue is, is it is accurate, but as humans, we look at the result and we assume the machine got it right. Yeah. So you, so you go to a customer, right? This is, this is practical. They ran a thousand tests and they say, here, we got these 50 wrong. Yes. Well, it's not working. No. Yeah, it is working. It's 89% accurate. Mm -hmm. Every hundred people you test, you're going to get 11 wrong. Five and a half are going to be false positives. Five and a half are going to be false negatives. It doesn't, people can't process that. They're like, okay, so this means I hire a hundred people. I got 10 wrong. Yes, that's what it means. And you knew this before you started. So yeah. that, that's, that's one issue. The other issue is having it fall in the wrong hands. And, and the other is what happens when uh, you accept terms and conditions, and it includes using that camera to read your 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 behavior. Interesting, because it's right now you need a super powerful scanner. Yeah, but at some point you're gonna be. Let's say you're using uh, to not use any brands. Let's say you're using a messaging software, and you are uh, doing a video call. And you accepted uh, the terms and conditions, and now that company is uh, looking at your pupils mm. and using that to build a model mm -hmm. that is a hundred percent accurate. And people don't even read those terms. Yeah. So, so you know, it, it, there's there's issues now, so, and there's know, big you issues. Said, you said don't build, you not, don't name brands, obviously, but um, you're, you're saying that there's people out there that could be doing that. No, I think the cameras can't do it yet. Okay. So the scanner that, see, that looks at your eyes though. is super I powerful. I don't see why though, because with you know, like with computer vision, like what we're talking about, um, your accuracy is going to be lower, right? Um, but simple things like where the eyeballs are going, we can eye track now. Yeah, but it's not so. So when you go look at the studies, what we do know is all that stuff about eye movement and all that. It's not indicative of deception. Okay, the way you move. So it is more the dilation, like, you're, it's, like controlling it's, your blood pressure is going to be. Blood pressure is a good one, but that's used by polygraph, right? Okay. So, so uh, the uh, ocular uses uh, pupil size, blink rate, um, and some others that that are I, I can't mention, but uh, it's let's say pupil dilation. It's a hundredth of a millimeter, so that camera. Could, you know, it's not even close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. These are yet. super powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yet. Yeah. yeah. But they, when they, they do... They, yeah, they just keep getting higher, higher resolution. So you're tracking gaze and size, yeah. basically. Yeah. About 200 things that have to do with gaze and size. Okay. You cannot do that with a camera yet. Okay. So when you do, yeah. now you have every person carrying a lie detector, feeding that data into the cloud. Now you have an issue. I think I think we're going to grow to that point anyway. In some, so so part of me embraces that, and part of me, um, I think no matter what, regardless of what technology, whether it's you know like a Neuralink, 
um, where we can, you know, feed thoughts to each other directly, non-verbally. I, I think that that's going to open up um, faster communication. I think that there's mm -hmm. people who have empathy, um, and let's say let's say you have a neural link with a patient, and you're a therapist. The ability to to really understand that mm -hmm. person's every split second thought and reaction allows you to do your job better. Mm -hmm. But like you're saying, I'm in a job interview, and they say, you know what are your top five fears or what do you think is your greatest weakness? And you're immediately going like, uh, I'm lazy. I'm always late. Uh, I like to drink on, you know, Monday night. Uh, well, I would say that my greatest weakness is, and then there's the real answer, right? And we all have this filter. I would say that that would be a bad application, yeah. you know, of that and, yeah. and being able to, yeah. to, to tell immediately if somebody's lying or not. Is, well, when you ask questions, uh, for lie detection, you have to be very specific, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you want to ask, did you lie on your resume? Mm -hmm. That is a gray area because my intention was not to lie, but maybe I know Fluffed I got the it. dates wrong. Yeah. Let's say you did it. Let's yeah. say you were completely honest, yeah. but you don't remember the exact dates of your first job. Yeah. So now you take a lie detection test and it's... You lied. You may as it, well it, it, not it, graduated it, from Harvard. You, yes, that might happen, or or it might just be inconclusive. Yeah. Why Why is the test inconclusive? Because of that question. Because yeah. you don't you don't get uh, you don't get answers for specific questions. You get a result for a test. So if that test includes that bad question, yeah. Now the whole test doesn't work. Yeah. Right. So so you have to be careful. It's like those questions. Uh, your weaknesses. It's just such a stupid question sometimes, mm -hmm. right? In interviews, it, it just doesn't make sense because yeah. you know that's what's going to happen. They're yeah. going to think about something, say something else. It's a situation that will never repeat itself. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, I just think we, we, you know, as we improve the technology, we will learn uh, to be more specific. And now what, what you should do is just build a model that tells you if, if a question makes sense or it doesn't mm -hmm. before you put it through. It's not that hard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I think those questions are more along the lines of can somebody think on their feet, right? Especially, I mean, you've done plenty of sales interviews. It's like, you know, it's it's going to be situational to see, like, hey, can this person express themselves in a professional manner? Are they going to Are they going to crumble under pressure? Like, yeah. sell me this pen type of stuff. I hate those, but you better you better be like that's you your that's your career. You better have an answer. I agree. I, some answer, even yeah. if it's even if it's just, and they're going to learn very quickly. Is he factual? Is he creative? Is he, you know what I mean? I I hear you. I just think that there there's a reason they're still there. Unfortunately, yeah. no, I agree. I like those questions in in terms of an interview. All I'm yeah. saying is they're not good for lie detection, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. But you got to ask those questions and see how people react because there is nothing better than a smart person answering a stupid question. You, you, you take this very stupid question, you give it to a very smart person, and they come up with awesomeness. Mm. Right? So, mm -hmm. so, so, layers, uh, layers. Yeah. layers of stuff that you're like, wow, this is great. This guy knows, or this girl knows what, what she's talking about. Yeah. Right? Uh, sell me the pen, and they come up with this whole thing. And it, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm saying is, it's not for light detection. Yeah, that's a separate story. Right? I, I'll tell you, as, as two sales guys, like what I listen for is I want I don't want them to sell me the pen. I hate I hate it when people. This is a tangent. We're, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do we're go gonna there. To, we're gonna do more podcasts. <laughs> let's right? go there. But when somebody's when I say <laughs> when I say sell me sell me this pen, or if somebody asks me, my first question is like, well, you know, it's blue and it's bright and it's a clicky thing and it has this. It's very comfortable. It's including ergonomic. Do you have you, do you like ergonomic things? Like, why would you do that when you immediately need to start asking questions? Like, tell me, tell me about your usage of pens. Tell me how many pens you have. What's, tell me about the features of your favorite pen, yeah. right? You're gonna sell me, you're gonna, you're gonna to sell me on why you want this pen, and I'm sure. gonna understand why. And immediately, and I, I listen for that. That's something that I listen for. It's like with that question. But if I get somebody who's, you know, starting to lie, be, you know, this is the last pen on earth type of scenario, then you immediately go, okay, do I want this person working with my customers? You know, do I want them representing us? Yeah. If they're gonna if they're gonna be like this lie detection test, you know, it says ninety percent, but really, um, I think I think it's a good thing that it's ninety percent in some ways, right? Um, because that way there is still some 
So, so first of all, um, I'm probably a 5% lie detector. Sure. So we've already gained 85%, right? Um, and second to that, I, I think in that way, it kind of opens up um, subjectivity. Like there's, there's a possibility. It's like, um, imagine if, you know, there, so, there's, so there's error in, in drug testing as well. Right, somebody could. There could be false positives, or even screening for a disease. There could be false positives. That's why you do it a second time, right? So it's ninety percent the first time. It's, my math sucks, but it's ninety-eight. I heard something the other day. A guy said, um, "Yeah, I think it was Doctor Phil." He goes, "My math is so bad. Sometimes I, when I add two plus two, I don't even get five all the time." Yeah. <laughs> well, if you combine ninety and ninety, if they're different tests, mm. not the same, mm. different tests. So let's say a polygraph and an ID type test, mm -hmm. you get about 98% accuracy. Oh, wow. Right? You combine, uh, you combine those, combine those two. Um, if it's the same test, it's still going to be 90. Oh. So you need to, two different methods that measure different things on the same subject to get that plus, right? So uh, okay. we call that consecutive barriers. Okay. So when you're going to hire someone, like for, a, say, an FBI job, you put them through both tests. So they, now you're, you're using error. this today. These technologies, not the, F, uh, the no, the FBI, no, no. But some governments are okay. Uh, some I can't say who is using it, but I would say many governments are. Yes. Yeah. So you put them through both tests, and then you get about ninety-seven and a half percent mm -hmm. accuracy, which is which is really good. Yeah. The issue is when you combine two. 25, let's say 90 and 90, yeah. about 25% of the time, they won't coincide. Interesting. And then the customer gets frustrated. Yeah. It's math. Yeah. It's not our fault. It's math. There's going to be 10% here, 10 here, yeah. combined, it's about 25. So if you put 100%, uh, 100 people through both tests, in 25 cases, the tests will not coincide. And then you get into the discussion of why. You know, so, mm -hmm. so, and that's a long discussion. So yeah. you could, you could talk about the why from my ignorant scientific perspective on that. I could talk about the why for an hour. If you ask one of the doctors that, that did the studies, they can probably go weeks, mm -hmm. months, years explaining why. Breaking it out into, yeah. I'm sure physiology, every, every human's different. That's probably the shortest version, right? It's just, that's one. so unique. Don't, don't, even, don't even think about uniqueness. Think about this. It, it, it just combine 90 and 90%. Yeah. Combine them in an Excel table. They won't coincide 25% of the time. If you take two dice, 100 and 100, 25% yeah. of, you know, you're going to yeah. get the same results when you, once you run the numbers. So you just need more tests at that point, right? You need a third. Y yes, that's one option. The other option is doing an interview and saying, look, you passed this, you didn't pass that. Mm -hmm. Now, the test has to be exa exactly the same, right? Yeah. So you can you can dig into other things. I mean, you're not going to decide just on the test. Or like right? you're saying, there, well, there's the human component. At that point, you're validating, you know, the things. If if you're going back through it with them, and um, wow, we're going into a tangent. I want to talk about jujitsu too. <laughs> it's the same thing. I know the people of <laughs> people have hung in through this conversation. They should people of jujitsu people should get some jujitsu. You gotta listen to this first. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta listen through it. You gotta push through. <laughs> but but. Uh, at that point, you know, if you have the polygraph and you have the, the eye, so you're going to, you're going to get at that point, you're kind of assuming that there may be some things that like specific questions that you're unsure about. They're like the question mark, right? Those are things where you would bring in humans and you start going back through history and you start basically, you know, validating that. Like you said, when, when, when you were in, I don't know, you know, college that you had never done drugs. And that was a questionable thing. Um, you know, give me the names of your roommate, your parents, your, yeah. you know, um, I want your records from college. I want, and then, then you, at that point now you're, you can actually dig in and decide whether it's just, whether they were near, near drugs when they were, you well, know, don't forget in, in college. The machine makes mistakes. Yeah. That's it. It's not perfect. So when you dig into that, you do a background check, hey, maybe it was a polygraph, maybe it was the ID type. 10% of the time, it's going to get it wrong. Yeah. So it's normal. Well, I'd say the human that, that programmed, that built the model, made the mistake, 
and um, and we'll get better and better at it. And when we have machines yeah. that are building their own models, like that's what deep learning is. It's it's iterative learning. Yeah. Right? So, it's, so, so it's changing over time. The, the model. The last time I had this this discussion was already nothing like the initial model humans built mm -hmm. because it's not being built by humans, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it's completely different from the initial. Yeah, all the improvements done with with machine learning make it completely different from what it was. Yeah, it went from eighty four percent to eighty nine in a couple of years. It took twelve years to get to the basic model. But that's what scares <laughs> me when when it says it's ninety nine point nine nine nine. Um, we almost hold it up like a godlike figure that's infallible, and that's what that's why I said with the ninety percent. That's good. Ninety nine point nine 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 scares me because there is a percentage, or there's a, a fraction of a percentage that it could be wrong. Yeah. And um, yeah. but that's why you need multiple uh, uh, artificial general intelligences instances, um, and 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 really you need almost a a. A group like you're almost going to have to form a government of artificial general intelligence because you can't have one that, that defines the truth or not. You know what I mean? Like it takes on this godlike type of, and, and people will treat it as such um, because when you ask a machine um, the most complex question that you can think of and it gives you the answer, you know that it's infinitely smarter than you. You know, people yeah. people do that. You know, we hero worship. So yeah, it's something. There's scary. a lot of that. I think. Um, we so this this brings us to to understand that knowledge, experience, and intelligence are completely separate from mm. one another. So we mix them all together, right? Yeah. But, but you know, you, you you acquire knowledge, you apply it, you gain experience. We confuse that with intelligence. Mm -hmm. You use intelligence when you do when you solve a problem that you've never seen before. If you've seen it before, it's experience. And you might have the knowledge to solve yeah. it. But we confuse all those. Yeah. It's like, oh, he's so smart. He knows how to make coffee. No, he's done it a million times. It's not, if, it's if not he's, smart. If he's a monkey, experience. we're in agreement. Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. So, so yeah, if it's an AI, you're like, well, that, that amongst a billion other things. I, would, yeah. you know, I, I think you're right. We, we, we conflate those. Um, I, but I also think that if you put you know, 10 philosophers in a room, not one of them would come up with the same definition of what intelligence is. Absolutely. You know, at least when you get down to the nitty gritty, I think the short form is, is the ability to survive in your environment. So if I'm, if I'm dropped into sub-Saharan Africa, um, without any tools, I'm dead. Yeah, you don't have, you know, but, but if I take somebody who was born in a small village in sub-Saharan Africa and I drop them into, you know, a data center and I say, fix it, well, I don't know if they're dead. Maybe they can't figure out it. But is, isn't that knowledge applied knowledge? That's applied knowledge, and and with time, um, they could they they perhaps are an intelligent enough, but it's the application of mm. of that knowledge and experience. Yeah. So that becomes intelligence in some sort of definition, or is it just well, applied knowledge? Like I said, ten experience? ten wouldn't agree. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. A, it's a good it's, conversation. It's a, it's I'm a hard yeah I bringing it up. It's a hard question. Man. It's it's the same in jujitsu, right? Um, yeah, let's talk jujitsu. You, you, let's talk old man jujitsu. Yeah, you, here, here is the analogy again. Intelligence is that guy. Jujitsu intelligence is that guy that has been training for six months and is better than all the blue belts. Knowledge and experience is a guy like me, zero talent, but I've been doing it for so long that I can apply a bunch of knowledge that I've learned from people that know more than me. Mm. So I have zero jujitsu intelligence. It's all experience. It's mm -hmm. just not applied knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but when I started, I, I was that guy that for three years couldn't do an armbar. Uh, mm -hmm. So zero specific intelligence. It was just hard work. Knowledge, applied. Knowledge, yeah. applied. So knowledge and experience, you end up learning, right? So, so it's, and you it's don't the same thing. you feel like thing. that's jujitsu intelligence? No, I feel like that is experience. Huh. Knowledge applied to me is experience. To me, intelligence is the innate ability to do something that you have not done before better than someone that has limited experience in it. But you could. So if I said, well, um, hey, I've invented this new te technique. It's called the barat, flying barata plata, right? Um, and you would be able to apply that significantly faster because 
you, you know what a bra to plata is, you know what a flying arm bar is, and you'd probably figure out pretty quickly how to set that up for yourself. Where yeah. me coming in with no jujitsu knowledge, I, I wouldn't yeah. I wouldn't be able to. It's, yes. it's like because 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 right because that's where people get better at jujitsu is being able to be, start to chain stuff together. It's like okay, well, I, here's yeah. my one or two takedowns. Here's my one or two guard passes. Here's my one or two, you know, um, uh, transitions and yeah. submissions. Yeah. Well, if if you can, I think you're humble. If you think a model, <laughs> I think you're a very humble guy. Nah. <laughs> you're like I don't know anything, but I'll kill you if you if you <laughs> if you dig it down. <laughs> Again, a model can find patterns, so maybe I can do the flying barato plata because I know how to do the barato plata on the mat. Mm -hmm. That's experience. Mm -hmm. It's not intelligence, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you know. So, so, uh, but yeah. Again, it's 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 a new thing that you can apply quickly because of the previous experience you had. I wonder if you. I wonder if you connect. And I'm not saying this is right or wrong because we're we're just talking about it. Like I'm not. I, oh, yeah. I am not settled on this, right? But I wonder if you use um, aptitude and in intelligence together. Like, like I think to some extent IQ is a good measure of intelligence. But if I'm a non-English speaker and I'm taking an English IQ test, I'm going to fail. But I might be Albert Einstein. So sure. I just I wonder I wonder if you. You know, and obviously an Albert Einstein type guy, he had an aptitude for science and he'd probably, he'd find a way anyway. But I wonder if, if you feel like um, some people, you know, just, a, a, I've trained with them, you know, they've, they, I'm thinking of, of one, one guy in particular at my gym when we started around the same time and he had different physical skills, as gifted athlete, but things just made sense to him. He's just like, do this. And I'm like, what is that? He goes, we learned it last week. If you say so. Right, I don't remember last week. Uh, you know, I don't certainly yeah. don't remember the move last yeah. week. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I agree. And and the thing is, they don't exclude each other, right? If if you have knowledge, and you apply it, and you gain experience, and you use your intelligence, you're yeah. going to be that guy that is purple belt in a year, right? Yeah, purple belt level in a year. Yeah, because he say, has level. all three. Yeah, right. Maybe my intelligence is more on the sales side, and I'm good at it. Um, and maybe for jujitsu, I just didn't have the talent that some people have. Mm -hmm. I had to use knowledge and experience. So I just think those three things help you break down a little bit your, your learning process. Mm -hmm. If you tell me we're going to do something new in sales, I'll probably just go at it. I know it's going to come out good <laughs> mm -hmm. because there's experience and I have intelligence mm -hmm. for that. You have the aptitude. If you tell me we're going to do this new jujitsu move, I'm going to have to drill it for a few months before I even try it interesting yeah i don't have the intelligence yeah. but but i i work hard, hard at it i i you know i take the knowledge yeah. and play it many times and sometimes the result there is better than the uh, intelligence uh when they don't work at it yeah so you know it's just it's just different ways of doing things but um it's the same thing you know when you build a model uh, it's usually just applying knowledge uh, initially applying knowledge to uh, data and then at mm -hmm. some point it becomes a little bit more intelligent because now it's starting to find things mm -hmm. that it was never taught initially so mm -hmm. I think we just we, goes to show like when we're talking all this computer stuff we we're talking about we're just trying to repeat what the human brain does it's hard and we might even be doing it wrong maybe the human brain isn't optimal it's just the way biology yeah. worked out um, so yes that's a good point that's a <laughs> so great point. you so you um, I, and I've talked about this before <clears throat> it's like we got to get into silicone to really know um, and have access to all the data and and um, and resources. But so you you had mentioned one point, and unfortunately, I never had the opportunity to to take you up on this. My health issues. Um, you said that hey, I can show you some things, some old man jujitsu stuff that will help keep you uh, safer, train train safer. And I, I that's that's sat in the back of my mind since you said that because obviously. You know, when I get this back fit thing figured out, I'm going to be back on the mat, and that's 100% like what what I need is like how do I at 42 um, continue to improve in my jujitsu? Mm -hmm. um, I can't drill a move a thousand times, right? Yeah. My knees will give up, right? Yeah. If not my back first, or you know, or some other body part. Sure. Right? You know, so so how how are you? 
continuing to get better. Uh, have you had many injuries? I've had some. Yeah. Major, some, like sur- requiring surgery or just... Some that time? should have required surgery that I didn't do, like bicep tears and things like that. Okay. Those those were the worst. I have two bicep tears. Okay. Left and right arm. Both. Um, what else? Cuts and bruises, um, elbows, shoulders, back, knees, ankles. The whole, the whole thing. Yeah. It's normal. It's just empty. It's something that you do have to deal with. Normal to us. Yeah. Some, <laughs> my mom's listening to this going, what? what? Normal? Injured is normal. Yeah. <laughs> but there, there's a lot of things you can do. So, so, so let me give you a good example of this. Um, your first jiu-jitsu class is you start with a self-defense technique. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's the beginning. Why is it that every time you pass someone's guard, you take a knee to the nose? Okay, so now what you're saying is passing the guard is more important to me than protecting myself. Okay? Hmm. So now when I'm rolling, there's two things. Number one, I'm rolling not to win. I'm rolling to learn. Hmm. So really leave your ego yeah. outside. Right? And the second thing is as soon as I'm passing the guard, I'm looking at the knee and I'm covering that knee because it's coming to my face. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, it's just a matter of understanding where things get dangerous, and don't be there. I think that that comes with experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, guys that are starting, I would say, train with the right people. Um, it's funny because I was I was I was in Monterrey a few months ago, and this little girl uh, comes to me and. And, you know, we, we, we finish the class and I say, uh, guys, remember, be, be good training partners, right? Mm-hmm. Typical. Kids, be good training partners. Be kind to your teammates, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. So the class is over and we're taking pictures and she comes and says, hey, Fernando, what, what do you mean be, be good teammates? Be good training partners. I didn't have an answer. I'm like, oh, geez. Uh, so I gave that's, her the typical, That's something right? a professor says. Um, well, be kind and, you know. So, so I spent a few months thinking about that. Mm. So what's a good answer, right? That applies to kids, adults, to everybody. So this is where I came up with after thinking about it a lot, just putting it through my model. So I think you should, you should accomplish three things when you train. Number one, you should learn something. Mm-hmm. Number two... Your partner should learn something. Mm -hmm. Number three, you should make sure that that person wants to train with you again. If you accomplish those three, it's going to be fun. It's Mm going to be safe. Both of you will learn Mm -hmm. and you get to do it again. Okay. So if you break that down to the basics, it means if I'm a 200 pound guy, black belt, rolling with a 120 pound uh, white belt, I need to make sure that I learn something, Mm -hmm. that my training partner learns something, and that we're both happy at the end. So that forces you to be safe, to be considerate, to be a good training partner, to make sure that that person, you know, it, it makes no sense if I go smashing on a two month white belt that is 130 pounds. Yeah. What am I going to learn? Just how to be a whale. Mm -hmm. What is he going to learn or she? You're just going to get frustrated. Mm -hmm. We don't learn. That person gets frustrated. They quit. And you're an idiot. Yeah. So to me, it's those three things, right? Learn. Make sure that you learn. Make sure that they learn. Make sure they want to train with you again. That applies to everybody. I know world champions that are really good at that. And I know guys that go to the San Antonio Open, uh, win one fight, and they train like they want to kill everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of being competitive or not. It's a matter of being smart. If you can't do that, you're not really smart. It's so basic, right? So so that answer is, I'm just trying to break down that question. So going back to the old guy question is uh, those three things. And then you got to be a little bit 
you got to be smart in choosing your training partners. If, if you train with someone and you don't get those three things, start to ignore them. Hmm. You, you, can't, you can't train with a guy that hurts you. So that's, that's, those are all gems, by the way. I'm probably going to cut that section out. And I might write a blog article about that if you're okay. I'll yeah, absolutely. You because I agree. Um, I, and I have heard that, like, you know, have, a, have a, a purpose for every role, focus on something that you want to learn in that situation. But you're right. Uh, you know, sometimes, but sometimes if you come away from a role and you don't feel like you really, you know, did what you're capable of doing, sometimes you feel like you didn't leave it out on the mat, you know, because there's, 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 there's these kind of, and I guess just like, as in life, there's um so there's some friction in terms of just different mindsets like like one of them and, and maybe this is just the people right is you're going to have these like young athletes that are they're on their way to fast track to black belt and highly competitive and then you have your journeyman like i would say like myself right and you where you got you have a family you have work you have you know jujitsu is one of the things that you do that makes you feel better and you enjoy doing mm -hmm. Um, and those people are going to be on a different track and, and where one is probably going to be able, you know, it's going to, that mentality of like, well, I've got to improve. I have to go whole time, right. For both my physical performance as well as my, um, um, sorry for my, uh, fitness as well as my ability to, you know, to grow and mm -hmm. my moves. Um, I'm, I'm more in that camp and, and what you're saying, you know, while they should be applying that too, that hits me, but I have been in roles, and maybe I've been this guy too, so I'm not excusing myself. Um, I know that I have an ego like everybody else, but I've been in roles where it's not until you're in the middle of a role that you realize, hey, this isn't, this isn't safe. And maybe that's truly learning jujitsu of like, how can I get safe in this situation? Yeah. Um, but you mentioned you know, picking your training partners well. And let's be honest, it's a lot like a dance class where you go with a person, but they're like, you need to learn to dance with a lot of different people mm. and they rotate you through. Well, you're, you know, I might, I might know somebody who's a gentle giant who's less likely to hurt me. And I might know somebody who's like, you know, 130 pounds of, of coiled steel that, that might hurt. And I'm going to get paired with both those people. Yeah. Um, I don't really get a choice. You should. You should, or right. just be smarter at, at my current situation. Maybe I, just I, say, "Hey, I'm I'm injured. I'm gonna I'm gonna train with these people." And it's no offense to anybody else. It's just I know yeah. I know where I stand. Like I want to be able to pick up my kid, and a role isn't worth it, and hurting somebody's feelings isn't worth it. Um, I need to I need to be smart in who I choose. I, I think that's one. Uh, second thing is you need to be at the right place, right? So you had a, you, you have a great professor. Oh, yeah. If you talk to your professor and you say, look, I'm going to start training, but I need to train with people that will take care of me. You can talk to your professor. Um, also, you have to be able to survive those roles. Mm -hmm. right. so, so, so as I got older, and this is, I'm going to talk about me right now, but I don't like talking about me and jiu-jitsu. More general ideas I think are better. But as I got older and I get to roll with 25-year-old black belts, uh, we have a couple of 20-year-old brown belts in Houston that are just killers, just killers yeah. right? Yeah, they can win black belt divisions anytime. Um, so that gets me to a point where, okay, how can I... I'm going to learn a lot. How can I make sure that they learn and stay safe? So I started working a lot on defense. Okay, so stay in safe positions, uh, get better at your escapes. So they get a good role and, and you're safe. But again... There is no rule that says, professor, I'm not training with that person ever again, unless they change because I'm getting hurt yeah. and I'm a 40 something year old. I don't yeah. want to get hurt or I won't be able to train. So there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You can even yeah. tell the person, you know what? I'm not going to roll with you because you're too heavy. You're too strong. You're too good. You know what? Uh, my back hurts. I'm not training with you. My ego just, just squeezed up a little bit when you said that. I'm like, I can't tell somebody that. Why not? No, you're right. I should be able to. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my ego. And I do that all the time. I'm like, I can't roll with you today. You're too heavy. My back hurts. All and the their, time. Re their response is, well, we'll flow roll. I'll go light. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll give you a chance. I'll give you a chance. Let's try that. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see. Right? Let's yeah. see if that's true. And maybe, maybe they have learned. You never know. People learn. Yeah. 
You know, it's it's you don't you don't get to a jujitsu class knowing anything, mm-hmm. and that is you know, giving someone a, a safe role is something that you learn. Yeah. So I think it's it's about being I, honest I, I and safe. That's, that's part of my problem, I, and I do I do give people the benefit of the doubt. You sure. Know? And it's not the thing is is that, and I'm and I'm doing I'm doing this. I'm saying other people. Really, it's me. Like mm-hmm. what what you described is like I've been that guy. I've been the guy that says, this is okay, I'll go light. And then I catch myself giving a bit of pressure. Um, you know, I, I have an ego, I'll say go light, and then I'll muscle something just yeah. because I'll, I'll see it there. So, you know, it's it's probably like, um, when we talk about a journey, like this is beginning white belt, you know, this is black belt and beyond. Um, in order to get there, like we're all following this different track. And I look at some people's track and I say, that's the one I want to be on. That's who I am. And that track gets me injured and and ends up not, people not, you know, I think I'm the training partner people want to train with. Like I can think of, when I'm talking about these times, I'm thinking about probably four or five unique times where I've felt like I've been kind of a jerk. Mm-hmm. Um, who knows what was going on that day or, or why or, you know, yeah. you know, but, um, but this one I'm on right now is my journey and this conversation is my journey sure. and and understanding how i'm going to be as a as an athlete or a jiu-jitsu practitioner is um that's it's it's important to me to, yep. to to learn from this situation and and when i'm when i am back to to be able to implement that just be smart be smart about it you know don't i think again every time you go to class you have to focus on learning yeah and and a lot of people don't do that. They just train to win, train yeah. to win. And you know, it's, it's not what you're there for. There's, there's no medals, yeah. you know? Now, that doesn't mean you don't have hard roles. I mean, there's, there's a couple of guys at, at the gym where I train now that uh, they're my age. Isn't that funny? Similar belt. Yep. And we know. Those are the ones you're gonna go to war with. We go at it. <laughs> yeah. We go at it. <laughs> Yeah, it's like yeah. This this is it. No, there's a couple of guys that one of them will basically take your foot home. <laughs> the other guy knee bars you all the all the time. Um, the other has this this crazy knee slice pass. He puts his knee through your sternum oh. into your gut. In hey, the, yeah, in, in let's the pass, go just right up the let's middle. Go at it. Oh yeah, wow. oh yeah. Let's wow. go at it. You know, so so. With some people, you just go because they're your age, kind of your belt. Mm-hmm. Nobody's gonna get hurt. Nobody's gonna be offended. Yeah. The technique is clean. Yeah, you know that's the most important part. And we tap fast. Yeah, we tap fast because we're not letting go. Yeah, but but we know. So it's it's you know, that's an awesome. That's not a good you training know the rules partner. of the game. It's an awesome training partner. You're yeah. gonna learn a lot. They're gonna learn a lot. Yeah, and we get to roll every day, and we love rolling with each other, right? Yeah. So so that's the awesome training partner. Yeah. Um, you got to have those guys that you go at it. And after that role, you can't go anymore. That was it. That was 100%. Next role, you're defending from a white belt because you can't move. So you need those two. You yeah. need to have those training partners. Yeah. That doesn't mean that's all you do. Because if I, if I roll like that with a white belt, uh, they, number one, they won't come back. You know? Number two, I'm going to feel like an idiot. And number three, I'm not learning. Yeah. And they're not learning. So it's so simple, man. Just, you know, pick your roles, find people to go hard with, and uh, just just be a good training partner. Mm-hmm. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. So you, you've picked up a lot of wisdom over time. On the, how, how many years you've been training? So with the gi, about, uh, it's going to be 10 years in March. 10 years. So... Um, and I and I met you as a purple belt, and you already owned the school. Uh, yeah, you we got it. At, you started as a blue belt. White. You, you, you bought you 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 bought yes. into the school as a white belt. I started the school. Tell me. No, no. I when I started the school. Yeah. I had never worn a jujitsu gi in my life. You're kidding. So I was doing Muay Thai and grappling. You're like me, just all in. That's this is what I do now. This is who I am now. Uh, I was doing Muay Thai and grappling. <laughs> So yeah. it wasn't that hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then someone said, oh, we should oh, train dude, in the gi. I was pricing out schools as a two-stripe white belt. Yeah, it was the same thing. So, yeah, so we started the school. It was Muay Thai and grappling. Someone said, let's start 
doing gi stuff. Mm -hmm. I had done a little judo as a kid, mm -hmm. a couple of years. So yeah, let's put on the gi and start training. And, and here, here we are like 10 years later. School's still there. Um, I have a partner that does the day-to-day -day stuff. And I do a lot of stuff remotely. Like I manage the website. Uh, I uh, follow up on some leads. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when people ask for information, I send them the information. I'm not that involved in the day-to-day -day, though, just because of distance, right? Yeah. But I think I think that's what you need in a partnership. You need those overlapping skills, right? And you're, you're not kind of messing in each other's. Yeah. Um, he's not. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Um, I, I want to go down that track, but I, I'd like to. So so that journey in 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 being being an owner, um, especially as like a, a you know early in your journey, and then and then now as a black belt, um, what what was that like in terms of acquiring and teaching and you know, literally sometimes probably the same day, yeah. right? I mean, who are you learning from? Who's your mentor? So my, my professor is Tyler. Uh, professor oh, okay. Tyler is the owner of Gracie Baja Brownsville. Will um, he be here today, do you know? The... He will be here today, awesome. I think. Um, so I learned from him a lot. Um, the great thing about Gracie Baja was once we became Gracie Baja, I had access to the uh, curriculum. Mm. So we were following that every week, every class, watching the videos, doing the drills, right? So I think we learned a little bit slower uh, or a lot slower than you would with a black belt on the mat. Mm -hmm. But my guys that are brown belts and purple belts, they're super creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have a couple of purple belts that come up with stuff that you don't see in a traditional setting where you have a black belt teaching class all day. I wonder I wonder if that's so so one would be like having a black belt in some ways would be so we're at an hour 5. We have 10 minutes. Yeah. We're good. So in some ways <laughs> there's there's like like rote memorization, right? And then like you said, intelligence or whatever, the application of and really a creative intelligence where um, you guys did discovery together very much like the Gracies in a garage, right? Or, or their original gyms. Um, you did discovery together, you workshop stuff, you got the basics from the best source possible, and then you worked on applying those and seeing how they work with your individual game. It makes me, it, it definitely makes me wonder, you know, it, it's easy, it's easy when you're starting out to go, I mentioned like a flying arm bar before. It's like you're a white belt and you're watching flying arm bars on YouTube and then, yeah, you might be in there with a few other, yeah. you know, and you're doing that but it's the basics that matter, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's your basic, yeah. your, like you said, your basic takedown, your basic pass, your basic choker arm bar. Yeah. And then, boom, like those should open up all kinds of, of, of avenues. Yeah, and, and you need a professor that lets you explore those. That doesn't say, you're doing it wrong, don't do that. You know, you need, you need that space, I think. And I think, in, in that sense, uh, I train at Gracie Baja Pearland now. Uh, professor Marcelo there, mm -hmm. He's amazing at that, man. Because when he shows a move in the advanced class, mm -hmm. he shows it without going into a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. He just shows it how he does it. But he usually makes a comment like, you find the grips that work for you. You find what works for your body type. Mm -hmm. You do it the way that you feel comfortable. right? So that, that's one of the things about Professor Marcelo that. that I've learned is, is he shows you the basics of an advanced position and he lets you go. He lets you go. Here are all these doors. Go find more doors. You know, open these doors that I'm giving you. There's more. Go find them. Mm -hmm. So he's he's amazing at that. Super good. Um and uh and going back to, to Monterrey, it, the thing about Monterrey is we we didn't have someone showing us the doors. So from day one we had to go out and find them. So we have mm -hmm. some guys that, you know, we have a couple of guys that came from the uh kids class that are now purple belts. Super creative, super creative. Um, adults too, but those, those kids, you know, uh, my daughters, they, they started in the kids class, now they are uh, blue belt and purple belt. Um, also, you know, very creative in that sense. So I think you need to find a professor, you need the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Find a professor that guides you, but 
lets you go open different doors, right? So that, that's ideal to me. Um, and I think Gracie Bach in that sense does a good job because we have a basic fundamentals curriculum that is very detailed in the techniques, but the advanced one only says today is guard bottom. It doesn't say what you're going to teach. So it opens the door, right? So I love that. that that's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, so, so going back to Monterrey, it's still there. It's, it's going to be 10 years in March. Um, we now have a group of brown belts. We have a group of purple belts. I'm the first black belt, um, and I expect to have many more in the next five years. Probably, we're going to probably have four black belts in another four black belts in about four or five years. So that'd be awesome. awesome. Yeah, it's an interesting dichotomy between being in a young school and, um, and a school that's been around longer with more higher belts. I, you know, in, in the school that, you know, when, when Professor Fabiana started the schools about the time that I started my jiu-jitsu journey, and, um, you know, we had her, obviously, she's an amazing teacher. Um, we had a couple of purple belts. I don't even know if we had a brown belt. We did, we did, uh, Coach Benito. No, he wasn't a brown belt then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we didn't even have any brown belts. And, um, and it was is interesting um, what that, I wonder sometimes what it would be like then to be, you know, I was still on the far end of the lineup, but I moved really fast, but to be consistently on that end of that lineup for a long period of time, but then to have all the, those resources that, you know, yeah. to, to learn from. Yeah. I don't know what that is like. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been in that situation. Yeah. I, I am now. Yeah. Right. But, but the perspective is different. Yeah. I've been doing it for 10 years. So, so now when I'm, you know, I'm training and there's four or five black belts and have been black belts for a long time, it's just not the same. It would be great to be a white belt in a school full of black belts yeah. when you start, right? I, I wish I, I had that. But if I did that, I would have to give up the opportunity of starting a school as a white belt, which is a unique experience. Yeah. Yeah. You won't it's find that everywhere. Very so personal journey. It, it was, it was, it, it's been fun and I hope it keeps, you know, and keeps growing. And I, I know we need to wrap up. Was it 850 was the time yeah. that we needed to go? Yeah. Can I ask you one question really quickly? Absolutely. And, and please give me the speed answer and then, um, we could do closing thoughts. Um, if you had, it's a hypothetical, but it's not. If you had a white belt that came to three classes and you have the opportunity for, you know, 30 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time in each of those classes to teach them a couple of things where if they, they, they were either in a situation after those three classes or they never came back. Um, let's say, let's say a, a female, right? A smaller female. Um, what what are the things that you would teach them in those three classes? So in that situation, it depends, right? If it's if it's let's say a hundred and twenty pound girl, I'll teach basic self defense. Definitely, I think that's what's most most attractive. How do I get a two hundred pound guy off of me, right? Yeah. If it's an athlete, I'll probably go more of the MMA route. Yeah. Like the self defense stuff, clinching, a little bit of more defending elbows, knees. Uh, so it just depends on the person. Uh, if it's that 120 pound girl uh, or a kid that's being bullied at school, mm -hmm. okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how uh, if I mount you, you can get out safely, mm -hmm. safely, and run away. Okay. So I focus a lot on that. I think um, I'm very old school in that sense. I think that your first technique should always be self defense. Mm -hmm. Your first week should be super heavy on self defense. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that the rest starts to make sense okay. as you progress, right? Um, that, that not only applies to smaller people, it applies to older guys too. So how do you get this 200 pound 20 year old off of you? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you survive? So it, it applies to everybody. Um, that's one type of person you get. The other type of person you get is the guy that wants to be a fighter, an MMA fighter. Mm -hmm. In those, you have the ones that come to learn and you have the ones that come to show off. So usually when someone comes to show off, it's like, train with that guy. <laughs> Matt Enforcer. Yeah, there's a difference. There's a different school for that. Big difference, yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious. So, so you'd say, so you're saying um, uh, self-defense. I'm guessing that's going to be like, you know, grip break, getting your arm away. Um, if they do get on top of you, it's, it's mount, escape, run. Things like that, yes. Okay. Also, if as guys... opposed to submissions and, and anything that might take time, correct. Okay. Or, or for example, things that we don't usually do 
like how do you get away from a guy that is holding your neck against the wall mm. like more life real yeah. life situations yeah so your girl someone grabs you by the neck and throws you against the wall how do you get out what yeah. do you do right um, also I like showing uh, what to do if uh, someone for example tries to grab you and pull you into a car things like that that are more specific to real life and and you know people do that they fall in love with it they start training and then it's all about arm bars and flying arm yeah. bars and bearing bolos and all yeah. that that's when it gets super fun and crazy right yeah I just I, I that's a question that I think I'm from now on I'm gonna ask everybody every jiu-jitsu practitioner is what are the couple things because I, I think that that's um, if you have an opportunity to save somebody's life um, then you know, with a, with a couple of moves, I wonder what those things would be to you know to help to help do that. Because most people yeah. quit, they, they they go away. But what's going to stick? What's going to stick? Well, yeah, that's that's on the technique side. I think on the uh, personal side, so that they stay, same thing. Mm. They got to learn something. You got to learn something, and you got to make sure that they want to come back. That. So it applies to the new student too. Yeah, I think that is that is those three things are the key to keeping the white belts there to blue. To purple and we can have another chat sometime about Man. why blue belts quit but uh, <laughs> I, I have a lot of uh, I've been thinking a lot about that lately yeah. in the last two years I've been thinking about blue belt retention you know mm -hmm. why do they quit why do they stop can you keep them what do you do but uh, white belts again they need to learn you need to learn they need to be happy they want to they need to want to come back and, and that's your responsibility that's beautiful not only as an instructor yeah as a te teammate so 95% of someone coming back is the team not the instructor mm -hmm. even more more than that right the instructor you know it's just a little detail but what what creates that sense of um, comfort and uh, I want to go back that's that's your teammates that's why you need to build a good team if you if you have a bad apple it doesn't really work right mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm very careful in that sense to make sure that people are a good fit um, I don't do it for a living so I get that benefit That's nice. so you get to control the culture. and I get to control it a lot more yeah yeah um, do you have any closing right, thoughts I know we need to you need to go no 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 I, I, I think I think we covered everything we wanted to okay. discuss I mean okay uh, just thank you thank you for having me hopefully you. you can do it again I hope so. I have a closing thought. I think that your your analogy for um, for jujitsu or your application of your knowledge of jujitsu of you need to learn, they need to learn, and they need to want to come back. It applies to all aspects of life. That's jujitsu, but that's also um, it's it's customers, friends, family, people that you love. It's it's across the board. So it applies to everything. I agree. Awesome. I agree. Yeah. Thank you, brother. brother I thank appreciate you. it. Good to see you very much. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe so you're notified when future podcasts come out. Um, tomorrow, which <laughs> I don't know when this is going to come out, but it will not be tomorrow. Um, I'm talking to uh, Chris Coffey, and he is with Google. Um, he is not here to represent Google, but he can give a lot of insight into uh, artificial intelligence, various tech initiatives, and specifically cloud computing and automation. Um, he's one of the smartest people I know, and I think you'll get a lot from that conversation. So uh, next episode is Chris Coffey with Google, and make sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening.